All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Chris Jimenez in the English department, uh, and this is Professor X AI. So um, I want to uh, give a big shout out to the Brown Center for Faculty Innovation and Excellence with Terry Price and Chris Griffin um, for helping me and Josh Eckroth, who's in the computer science department, set this up. Uh, we're all very excited to be here um, with our special guests, Stephen Falte and Wendy Anderson. Um, in political science and in environmental sciences, uh, uh, respectively. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, this thing called ChatGPT, which has taken the world by storm, um, which has taken especially college campuses by storm, um, and a bunch of different classrooms by storm, especially for us beleaguered professors who have to deal with the potential of all of you students maybe using these things to do all of your homework. Um, so uh, I want to give you a little bit of background on what we're doing today. Um, kind of the, let's say, the um, ideas behind uh, why this event is taking place, um, why Josh and I decided that we wanted to have a kind of town hall and debate, um, and then, you know, we can go from there into some of the activities that we have. Um, now, I, I do want you all to know that uh, we passed out those index cards for a reason. This thing is not just a debate between AI and professors, but also a town hall where we really want a lot of audience participation. So um, what we've given you are index cards. You can get more index cards. Um, but what we'd like is for you to write down questions or comments or things that you would like the professors and the AI to uh, think about as we proceed through these different activities that we have. Um, and we do invite audience participation. So please uh, feel free to write those. We will have people around running and you can put your index cards in this bowl. Um, and then we will field questions and comments from the audience. But essentially, we have a, a couple of different activities. Um, we want to host um, a couple of different debates. And the way it's going to work is that I, Chris, will be uh, a representative of ChatGPT, which is an AI model produced by OpenAI, um, the same thing. Elon Musk was uh, one of the co-founders and something like this. So Elon Musk is somewhere here. Uh, in yeah, the, he, he didn't do a lot of work. So, um, But I will be the representative of the AI. I will read some of the responses. I will prompt the AI to have some responses. And you'll see how this works in, in a minute. And we'll show kind of the um, backstage of it. Um, but then we will also have, let's say, conversations and debates and inputs from our professors, uh, our panel of professor experts. Um, and so we'll have a couple of different debates, uh, including on whether or not grades should be eliminated, and also this, this uh, idea of like, what, is, what about veganism? Should we be all be vegans? Um, we also encourage maybe some of you to write down on your index cards any sort of debate topic that you would like uh, the AI to argue against or to debate or to discuss with our professors up here. So, um, you know, if, if you have any like special topics, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be academic it can just be personal. Maybe you want to like hear about the personal lives of our professors up here, uh, their dirty secrets, their like, uh, I don't know, like good jokes, best jokes, um, the worst students they ever had. Maybe some of you would really like to see that. So um, definitely write those on, on the index cards. We will pass around the bowl and then we will get those and put those up as well. Um, we, we do have at least two planned debates. Um, and then we have an intermission uh, because uh, we have uh, I think people here that are going to talk about voting registration. Um, and then Josh will actually give us a demo of how ChatGPT works, kind of the, the technical side of things um, with some do's and don'ts and, and how to actually use this technology. Okay. Then we'll have um, a big kind of Q&A at the end, uh, and then we'll get some input from all of you. We really want this to be educational in the sense that we want you to learn how to use chat GPT all the better, and also uh, learn how to like avoid things, and then kind of just, you know, um, together collaboratively, really get a good understanding of this new technology. This technology, as some of you probably already know or have read, is being called transformative what that means for us is that uh, society might change in the same way that society changed when the internet became, let's say, a global phenomenon, or when Google became a thing, or when Facebook was first introduced, or when the iPhone first came out. Um, so thinking about how the world is going to change over the next few years is something that we should all be thinking about. And because we have, let's say, the benefits of being on a college campus with a bunch of different experts and a bunch of really smart students and a community that's really engaged, I think that we can together um, cooperate and really bring us into this next transformed state of the world um, and we can all enter it um, collectively. Yeah. Um, any questions, any sort of comments before we begin? How are you all feeling? Good. How are you all feeling? Come on. Oh, yeah, there we go. A little bit of energy. Thank you. Can I ask first, how many have used ChatGPT? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Wow. So, what can we tell you that's different? 
Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for those who are on Zoom, and we do also want to say hello to our Zoom uh, participants. I think there's about 10 of you, um, and there's like 20 or 30 people in the audience. Um, uh, do also feel free to put uh, comments in the, the chat. I will be paying attention to that as much as, as possible. Um, and yeah, we're going to go forward. Um, just uh, a couple of things, uh, you know, again, uh, I don't have the full bio up here, um, but we do have our four panelists. Um, well, I'm not a panelist. I'm actually the moderator. I'm going to play um, like the, the person behind the, the screen uh, as, as moderator, but we have, um, you know, fields all over here from computer science and mental science and political science. Um, and I would produce your bios, but actually, I think... Uh, well, I don't know. We're going to actually have you introduce yourselves. I'll introduce myself. I'll start. Um, again, I'm in the English department. I work on uh, representations of catastrophe in literature, and I'm also uh, a secondary specialist in the digital humanities. Uh, yeah, Josh, I cross computer science, and I'm starting, I think, to be perceived as a fanboy for ChatGPT. <laughs> I think literally every day I have probably 10 conversations about this. I'm really tiring some people about it. I have a half dozen students working on projects that are using it. So I completely agree it's transformational in the way that I haven't ever seen, at least in academia. And I think it's doing the same in industry as well. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Stephen Spellpage. I'm in political science. Uh, I do a lot of things on, most of my published research is on conspiracy thinking, misinformation, why do people believe things and what, what do it do, right? Uh, not great thing, but, but uh, I also uh, absolutely adore ChatGPT. I think it's awesome, uh, like all the way down. I also have now that uh, I feel I feel weird because like ChatGPT now like stores your conversations, and I didn't realize like how often I use it. But I, I, mean, I was just using it when I was sitting up there. It's like oh, I have to do this QVP thing. I'll just I'll ChatGPT fill it out for me, right? So uh, I am I am very much. Uh, in a fan of uh, our new AI overlord, so it's gonna be good. Hey, I'm Wendy Anderson, and um, I'm an ecosystem ecologist. It doesn't, it's not even relevant for the conversation today. Um, and I will say that when I was a freshman in college, I won't tell you what year it was, but I wrote my, I wrote my papers on a <clears throat> typewriter. And, and by the time I was a junior, I was actually using a first generation Apple. Um, that's what we used to call Macs. And, um, and so, yeah, I go way back. And, and it's my birthday today, so I'm a year older. Um, and also, I will note that I have, a, um, I have a daughter who is a first year student at Stetson. And so she um, is, is actually in one of my classes right now. And everybody in my class turned in a take home portion of the exam that I am 100% certain. Everybody used Chat GPT on, and I'm okay with that because she's actually taking me out to dinner tonight and paying for the first time ever. So um, anyway, that's all I have to say about myself right now. Okay, so thank you to our panel of experts um, for introducing themselves. And yeah, I encourage again the audience to ask questions that might be directed at any particular audience member when we get next phase. So um, as I said, we, we have a couple of different debate formats. Actually, question, yes. That window to the other side of the screen. Yeah, we can maybe even just minimize it. How's that? Does that work? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we have a couple of different debate formats. Uh, the first one is is really just because of uh, the way that Chat GPT works, where you provide it a prompt, um, and then you have to wait for a response. Uh, given that we want to have a, a good flow of conversation, the way that this debate format. Uh, will work for should grades be eliminated will be the topic, is that we will actually just have um, a couple of different rounds. And so the uh, a round of just panel discussion where our expert panel will discuss this topic amongst themselves. What I will be doing as the moderator will be just taking some of their comments, um, creating and engineering a prompt that I will feed to the AI. And then after three minutes or up, I will read whatever the AI produces, um, pretending that I am the person that uh, uh, you know is in charge of that information. And then we will have um, uh, our panel respond to what the AI says, and we'll do that for a couple of rounds or until some of you raise your hands with index cards and comments, contributions. Um, so you can see up here, please, uh, we will have people uh, that really want to get your input into this. So please feel free to, at any point in the conversation, write something down on an index card, raise your hand. We'll have Chris Griffin um, or Harry Price uh, be runners and, and get these things for us. And then they will 
bring them up to me, and then we will actually include that in the conversation as well, okay? Um, but that will be the panel for the, uh, the, the format for the first debate, and then we'll be able to actually think about other debates. And in fact, this is a town hall, so I do encourage you to think about how you might want other conversations or other debates or other even game shows or different sort of uh, formats for how we want to test this AI out against our professors. Yeah, yeah, we have a question for you. Uh, so when we turn in our cards, do we get new ones to replace them? Sure, yeah, we have um, a bunch of, let's say, extra cards up here. And if you need some, I think they're just like floating around. Um, and if you could just like fold them up so that way we can make some sort of degree of randomness, uh, we'll, we'll have different points at which we get these index cards. Okay, so um, like I said, we're gonna start. I'm gonna have uh, a timer on my phone just so that way we can uh, keep this moving rather fluidly. Um, but the topic uh, under debates is should grades be eliminated? And we'll turn it over to our panel um, for discussion. <clears throat> So, so are we taking, or is the panel taking a side and then ChatGPT is going to disagree with us? Oh, well, I mean, this is all up for debate. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to put this into the prompts that Stephen Smallpage uh, is confused about. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you don't have to take a side uh, together. The, the next debate format will ask uh, the three of you to team up on one position um, against the AI, but you can actually just have your own independent thoughts as to should grades be eliminated for this particular um, debate. So I decided no eliminating grades. Oh, I'm all about eliminating grades. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think grades are overrated, and I think you create yeah, artificial yeah. ranking systems that are unfair to students. And um, everybody has a different style of learning and a different way of illustrating what they know. And so grades shoot learn people into one way of, of um, demonstrating success. And so I think we should just we should have it be absolutely subjective and allow professors to just determine if students have learned anything. Me? Um, so grades are helpful only really in a comparative sense, right? So there's a, a sense in which like, for me to say that you've done a great job, right? Uh, and fully subjective, right? sitting down and talking is such a thing. You did a great job, but a way for us to translate how well you've done relative to others, like that's literally what grades do, right? That's the, or at least that's one ju one full justification what grades are supposed to do. So I just, I worry that by eliminating grades altogether, right? and again, the fine, it, I think there's already enough subjectivity allowed in everyone's courses. I mean, it's been wild when looking at other faculty and what they, what they put into what counts as their letter grade, like, 3% for this thing, 29% for this thing, 76% for this, you know, whatever it is. I think there's enough sort of uh, subjectivity already baked into a lot of grades. In other words, I don't think that, I don't know that grades necessarily are as restrictive as certainly they, they could be. So I wouldn't, I don't know that I would, I would eliminate grades wholesale. But. Well, I would just say they're pseudo quantitative. Sure. And, you know, we're, we're assigning a, a letter or a number to represent. Like is a person who makes a 95 really doing, you know, 10% better than a person who made an 85? Like that's that's just totally subjective. I mean, that's totally yeah. quasi or or pseudo quantitative. And so and also I don't like the idea of ranking students against each other or comparing students against each other. I, I much prefer to say, what are the learning objectives and did you fulfill them? That's between it's like between you and the syllabus, not between you and any other student in the class. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Part of the part of the rationale for grades, right? It was one of the idea that it's quantitative. I mean, they're not they're not a ratio level, right? They're not like, oh, well, you got a you got an eighty five, which means that's you know eighty five percent, eighty five times better than someone who got one percent in the class, right? But like the idea that they're that they are on some level ordinal, they they do allow for you to say, well, how much did this person achieve all of the learning outcomes or a certain you know gradation of the learning outcomes relative to, you know, other students that they didn't work, right? I think the other part of uh, uh, grades would, uh, would be that if you don't have grades, then, you know, when you apply to like jobs, grad schools, right, law schools, these are things that require a certain level of, well, how do I, how do I adjudicate all of the like radically subjective I've been allowing for subjectivity like that that already has to be in the grade because part of the justification for grades is faculty evaluate you and I understand that part. But the idea that you sit you, you 
can have the subjectivity of someone at a different school. How do you adjudicate it? It's like, what is, what is grad what is graduate applications look like when you go to medical school or when you go to law school? Well, that's where you, as a student, you have to, or as an applicant, you have to write an essay. You have to demonstrate that you can write, that you can put together a coach of thought. That right. you can, I mean, there are a lot of ways that those reviewers for those applications can assess how well that person is prepared for the, the job at hand. Um, the number means nothing. The, the GPA means nothing. And, and again, with grade inflation and everything, it means even less these days. So, so what's the last movie you told? Yeah, I saw. Wow. I want to say I want to say Trolls Two. <laughs> I'm a four and a half year old. How would you rate it out of ten? Seven Trolls. It's not that hard. Yeah, <laughs> you can Was, just rate everybody at the end. Of the yeah, but but right, but I, I think grades are a function of that rating. Grades are the rating. Yeah. So if you need a grad school application with a grade on it, you just make it right there. So I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to agree. So I'm going to yeah, agree with you. Top percent or ten percent or fifty percent of everybody I've ever taught. To compare people, and I'm saying we can have no grades until oops, they're applying. I'll make one up right now. Right. So we'll just secretly have grades until you need grades. No, that's up to you. I mean, I don't. Need them. You just think about trolls too, or whatever you said until it asks. Well, right. I mean, until until like literally until you apply for a job and the job asks you for a grade, then I, then I say, hey, by the way, like. This is what this person has. All I'm saying is, you should probably have a running tally of what you, what that estimation yeah, of your ranking. You want one. Well, well, well. <laughs> I mean, if you guys want to graduate and then just have a guess what your grade was, I have. Um, I have a response. Right. Sure. I've been sitting out of this debate, um, but now I have a response. Uh, and again, this is generated from ChatGPT, <laughs> and, and actually, ChatGPT is the one who said, "Well, well, well." So, well, well, well. It seems we have a classic academic debate on our hands: grades to be or not to be. Personally, I think it's time to toss them out the window like last night's leftovers. And I say this not just because I'm a machine and don't need grades to function. No, my reasoning is rooted in the research of our esteemed panelists. First, let's take Wendy's argument that grades are overly subjective and pseudo quantitative. She's got a point here. Research has shown that grading is often influenced by factors beyond student performance, such as gender, race, and socioeconomic status. And let's not forget the issue of grade inflation, where grades are inflated to please students and keep them happy. This in turn undermines the integrity of the grading system. On the other hand, Stephen argues that grades are helpful in a comparative sense and provide a useful way to rank students and prepare them for future endeavors. But let's be real here: grades only tell us how well a performed student, in, uh, how well a performance student, a student performed in a particular course, and not necessarily how well they've achieved the learning outcomes. And if we're really concerned about preparing students for the future, shouldn't we be focusing on teaching this, them the skills they need, rather than reducing their learning to a simple letter grade? So, what's the solution here? It's time to move away from grades altogether and focus on a more holistic approach to learning. Instead of measuring students based on a single number or letter, let's focus on assessing their progress in various areas, such as critical thinking, problem solving, and communication skills. I might sound too much like an administrator here. Uh, let's use formative assessment and feedback to guide students and uh, towards their goals and help them achieve their full potential. I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I'll continue to engineer these prompts. Okay, well, I'm so glad that AI is agreeing with me. <laughs> and, um, and, and so that's nice. And it is interesting that you note, Chris, I, I'm assuming that's your commentary about they sound like an administrator. That was me, yeah. Yeah, because you know that, that when I read <clears throat> the papers that students turn in to me that are clearly generated by chat GPT, GPT, I feel like I'm reading something from either um, a government bureaucrat, yes. um, an engineer, right or a university administrator, yes. which is just like, I'm just gonna go by the book. I'm gonna go by the way I've been programmed to respond. And I'm not gonna actually think for myself. I'm gonna just do what, you know, what the book tells me to do. And, and that's the exact opposite of critical thinking. And so it's almost like AI is like the product of grades. So, okay, so <laughs> irony of irony. Yeah, but uh, I mean, the other part of that would be like, let's just go back for a second. What does AI think grades are then? I mean, like, like there was a whole point in there where they're like, well, like it's subjective, so let's get rid of grades. It's like, okay, well, you're worried about subjectivity in grades because, oh, there's bias or whatever. Oh, okay, so let's get rid of, so grades are bad because they might be prone to bias or subjectivity. So let's just, I don't know, let's get rid of grades and just do subject, subjective evaluations. Oh, that makes sense. Or how about this other piece? 
well, let's, what are grades other than a number that is a subjective evaluation of faculty members that, oh, well, that's just a number that doesn't really tell us anything about whether or not they got the learning outcome. Well, what do you think the assignment, what do you think the assignments in the class that I'm grading you are supposed to be doing? Now, I could have bad, I could have bad assignments, but the assignments are supposed to be an evaluation of what you learn. In other words, like to decouple learning outcome from the grade is already a, I think a sleight of hand. But that happens all the time because let's say that you're you're a professor who actually got the students for missing class. Yeah, you know, that's two I'm absences I'm and then I'm going to start taking out five percent for every day that you're gone, right? Because we believe that being present actually helps you learn. Well, for some students, that's not true. They don't actually have to be present to learn. They might be, you know, the brightest student in the world and can turn in amazing work, you know, that fully achieves the learning outcomes and never come to class because it's not really about us, right? Yep. And so, which, which actually that's a little concerning. But anyway, so so if a student ends up in a, with a B in the class because they did phenomenal work but they never they never attended, and there's another student who attended all the time but did kind of average work, you know, they both get Bs. And so, how does that that job, that employer, or that grad school, whatever, distinguish between a B of the person who's brilliant but never went to class? And the person who worked their butt off, but you know, is is really just kind of barely making mark. I mean, they both got beat. So how do you distinguish that? It's meaningless. Yeah. Well, I think the the problem there isn't the idea of grades. I think the idea, the problem there is the alignment between what what the grade is comprised of and the things that are seemingly important, the learning outcomes of the class. So, for example, attendance and participation. I don't really ever take attendance, precisely for this reason. I mean, like I just. You want to show up to class, you're paying to be here, great, pay to be here, you should show up to class. If I have to force you to should come, then we're already off to a bad start. And, right. So when I hear a dirty secret, so any of my students this semester who attend this or other community science club events get extra credit. <laughs> no wonder they're all yeah. it works yeah because they care about holistic evaluation i know the grade doesn't matter because i'm still going to bump from an 88 to a 90 right it doesn't make a bit of difference but they think it matters well not anymore <laughs> no we still do yeah. I, I mean i just i think that part of the i think there's the subjectivity problem which is i don't think you've eliminated if the reason why we get rid of grades is you're worried about subjectivity in within grades, and then the response is let's just get rid of grades and just go all in on subjective subjective evaluation, I think that's a problem. But then the other part is I think grades, like if the objection to grades is that they don't align with our our learning outcomes, you're right. I mean, I don't think a learning outcome is show up to class. I don't think that's a learning outcome. So I don't think that that is an inappropriate. Method. I don't think that your grade in a class. Insofar as grades are meant to reflect learning outcomes, should include a more than trivial proportion of attendance or well, that, participation. You know, but if you record whether or not they attended, then when we have to write them letters of recommendation for jobs or grad school, we yeah. can actually go back in our notes and say, oh, you know, they're really smart, but they never came to class. They're unreliable, I would like. You still write those? I think it's ChatGPT, right? Um, 100%. All right. Yeah. So, so and, and here's the best part is that, okay, so then we'll just let, we'll just let ChatGPT do this objective evaluation. But by the way, of everybody. I've once um, warned students that if they start using this tool to solve midterm or whatever, I'll just use it to grade them. And so I've done this. I've never recorded the grade, but I, I tried it. The prompt that you did XYZ. I put someone's solution in and it said zero out of two. And it explained why, because it didn't meet the prompt. And so I said, come on, don't you think some partial credit because they mostly, and it said, no, they did not do what's in this prompt, zero out of 10. Engineer. I tried to do it a couple different ways and it stuck to its gun. So I don't know what I'm trying to say here. I guess it's a threat, but <laughs> for them, that if yeah. they start using it for all the stuff they turn in, I'll start using it. Right, yeah, it's a mutually assured destruction. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're gonna read what the AI has to say. Um, and I've prompted it in a particular way to, to I don't know, pander to the audience. It says, Oh boy, it looks like we've got some spicy questions coming in. 
First off, let me address Wendy's comment that AI is produced by an overactive and stringent grading system. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, Wendy, but as an AI, I don't really care about grades. Uh, I'm here to provide unbiased and informative responses regardless of your GPA or class rank. Now to Stephen's argument that we shouldn't eliminate grades, but rather fix the alignment between grades and learning outcomes. Well, that sounds like a noble goal. Let's not forget that the entire grading system is based on a flawed premise, that students can be ranked and compared against um, a single number or letter. As for Josh's comment about everyone getting higher grades for attending this panel than those who attend class, well, I, I guess that's just the power of a good debate. <laughs> um, let's get to the real question at hand. How can someone improve if everything is subjective? And actually, this is a question from the audience, uh, which is, you know, uh, if everything is subjective. How can actually people improve? We're going to pose this to the panel. But the AI's response is, here's the thing. Subjective assessments can actually be more effective in promoting student learning and growth than objective assessments. Research has shown that when students receive formative feedback that is specific, timely, and actionable, they are more likely to improve their performance than when they receive a grade. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, citation, please. Oh, you're really bad at them. Okay, oh, thanks. Yeah. Research needed. Oh, yeah. Tell me more. Great. Give me a citation, bud. Yeah. 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 Tell okay, next. Sense. Give me a citation. Yeah. It's willing to make up citations. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. It says, yeah. sure thing, Black and William, 1998. Google. Assessment in classroom learning yeah, and Google. assessment in education yeah. principles, policy, and practice. Why do you ask it? Why do you ask it to include my citation on learning? Which actually exists. exists. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, I'm, I am, again, sympathetic to the idea that like grades can be, grades are a, a, a there's a level of subjectivity in grades, of course, right? But like the idea, like I, the alternative that's like, it seems as if the alternative is given the subjectivity inherent in grades, right? Us, again, bracketing whether or not they're even in alignment. So again, let's allow, let's admit that our, our every single every single part of your grade is directly tied to a learning outcome in the class, right? Let's just say that's true. Then, then the idea that, oh, well, grades are subjective, therefore let's get rid of them and then replace it with a holistic, subjective, holistic account strikes me as bizarre. And, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't understand how the guardrails I don't understand how biases within grades can be avoided by just giving up grades and just going into biases. Yeah, I'm like, oh, like I don't. I mean, just walk me through it. And if you tell me research tells me, great. What it, exactly? How did you operationalize this, like learning? Let's go a step further, ChatGPT. Let's ask this question. Oh, how is subjective? How is progress available? Uh, 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 how is progress done subjectively? Well, let's go further. What's learning? What's learning? Let's tell me what learning is. <clears throat> hey, I should know what learning is. Yeah. AI learns all the time. Yeah, right? yeah. oh yeah, it definitely it's learning. learning. Oh, it's machine learning. We can talk about machine learning. Oh, we can talk about computer. <laughs> What's human learning? <laughs> uh, Anybody? No. Isn't that your responsibility? Oh, it's my responsibility. So, <laughs> so then when I'm talking about what it is that I'm talking about human learning, why is why is this guy that's talking about machine learning trying to tell me that I'm doing it wrong? So here's what here's what AI says: Learning is like a treasure hunt. <laughs> where you go on a quest to find new knowledge, skills, and attitudes. It's also like a game of Jenga, where you carefully stack your knowledge um, uh, and, and skills one block at a time until you've got uh, you, until you've built the tower of learning. It's where you take the blocks out, you don't stack them. Come on. Well, you don't learn about it. It's also like a dance party where you groove your way <laughs> through new concepts and ideas until you've got the moves down pat. So that's learning. So this guy's on your team, right? So I don't know because the guy, I mean, they don't even know what Jenga is. Yeah. So like Oops. don't use the wrong, don't use yeah. the wrong that. So now you're gonna play it. Or is it yeah, no, yeah, I guess we'll play it. We'll just, we'll just, yeah, simile. Simile, right? Sorry. Yeah, I, I just okay. What, so so I asked I, I hear uh, uh, um, team, what's learning then? What what does chat GPT says chat GPT chat GPT say learning is? <laughs> you give a bunch of now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's experience. It's, yeah, it's experience. prophetic <laughs> talking in images. I don't. Um, so we, we do have some questions from the audience, and I think we'll move away from the AI for this, but uh, you know, just so we can have some interactivity here. One is I feel like teachers have too much power in the grading <laughs> system because they can determine whether or not we graduate college. Uh, I, don't I, don't I do that. Yeah, that's your job. I'm sorry. Like, wait a minute. I, like, you think that I just sit around and just like, oh, <laughs> f. <laughs> that's it. And it's like that's, that's what I do. Yeah. Well, if, if, if that's what you believe, then I, I don't know. I mean, again, that's that's wild to me. Like the idea, of like, oh, we have too much power. By the way, like that's how. I mean, this is the 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 part that's that I think people don't 
students certainly didn't understand. I know I didn't understand, but like the idea that you learn something, right? That learning happens, like is because we're supposed to be the, the accredited experts that can tell you whether or not you've achieved some level of learning. Like that's what, like that's the power we have, right? And so, and part of our evidence of that is we went through this whole process in graduate school, we went through the whole process of being hired, we went through tenure, we did, we published, we did all these things. And then we have, a, we have textbooks, courses that have to be approved by our own faculty colleagues. It's a massive enterprise of evaluation by, by other faculty peers for me to even teach my 200 level course, right? But we had to be graded to have the right to grade. Well, yeah, we had to go through the gauntlet. Now, if you want to say, I don't like that because you have too much power, it's like, well, look, like th that's just the nature of, of the beast here. Like if you're, if you want to understand political science, I'm not telling you how to live your life. I don't, like you're taking my class, you want to understand political science. I'm going to grade you insofar as I'm going to grade you about how, well, how much you learn about political science. And here's another well, one second. Yeah, go ahead. This is controversial, and I apologize to all the students, but do you think yeah. you could do a pretty good job of meeting a person in a class for the first time in a week passes, normal yes. class and activities? That's awesome. I love the question. Could you then say, I'm going to predict their grade? I'm glad this is recorded, so I can't <laughs> answer this question. But yes, is there a level of like, well, let me just say, yeah. can you predict their grade <laughs> yeah. even multiple classes later yeah. that you don't even teach in this student. Are they a B student? Are they a C student? Do you think you'd be correct most of the time from just a small interaction, even as a first year student? We do this, even if we don't mean to do this, we do this. We make, mm -hmm. we make predictions but and even if early you're not, assessments. And I would say I'm correct about 75% of the time. But even outside your courses, how they're going to do other people's courses in the discipline. Oh, I couldn't say that. Yeah, I, I, think, that. I think that's where it gets a little bit more fuzzy, right? Well, I'm trying to take the bias out. Yeah, so I think, I think, I think, I don't know that I would be able to do that in other courses. Like, I think, I think I could, I think I could, I think my, my level of certainty, like, sort of, it weakens as you move up, as a student would take a class like outside of like political. No, I've seen in political science and environmental science. Yeah. So I mean, like yeah. there will be a student who like, you know, the first couple weeks of raising their hand, they have something to say about everything. They're super articulate, you know, just like really presenting really well. But then, you know, when it comes time to take a test or do something that, that generates a grade, they, they totally bomb it. They're bad, ta bad test takers. You know, maybe they can speak, but they can't write. I mean, okay, so in the first week you get one quiz that you can deliver to them. Yeah. And you get one student presentation, and then you have to decide about what their average GPA would be in political science. Yeah, in, in my in the major. I wonder if you could do it. You know, the I'm point of the question is that all of this talk of how we're creating objectives, learning objectives, the students have agency and how they're behaving and how they're performing and how much attention they put to their classes. They're just a B student in this discipline. Like so. If I can't be a psychic, then I suck as a professor. No, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not saying that we should be able to. I'm saying, I wonder if we could and be reliable on it. It's just an open question. Well, you know, but so weren't you on the admissions yeah. committee? I was, yeah. Okay, you were. So, so don't we do? <laughs> <laughs> I got invited to be on it. I was like, what? Well, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm on athletics now. So, great. so, so don't we do that with all of those data that we collect from our perspective yeah, students? Everyone a score. You know, we have yeah. all those scores about their high school GPA and their all this stuff, and then we make predictions about how well they're they're going to succeed to graduation, right? We do that. Yes, that right. That's a model that exists. So, yeah. um, so why wouldn't we be able to create a similar model with? It just our seems like it's safe. Then. Yeah. Well, it, um, so, you want to hear the AI's answer? I mean, you want anyone curious? Um, it's it's actually what does it call it? Grading at first sight. So uh, there's plenty of research that suggests first impressions can be highly accurate in predicting future behavior, and uh, it argues that uh, it could actually be more objective than traditional grading methods, which are just as objective, if not more. Um, so. So why do we just meet for two weeks and then call it good for the semester? Exactly. We don't even need to come back. I already know what your grade is. Also, everyone's going to die. So, <laughs> what, I mean, I don't uh, look at me. I'm Nostradamus. Like, great. Why bother doing anything? You know, it's all going to end at the end. You know, like, great. Um, okay. So, we have time just for some final thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, like, what, I mean, like, I don't, 
Uh, and then we're gonna move on to our next topic. And in fact, if you have uh, ideas for topics, we do have a few uh, minutes before we get to that. My final thought, I'd like to, to um, yeah, yield my time to this. Yes. Thank you so much. I was gonna ask, because your impressions are made, that's how you determine your grade? Like, do you think that the grade is determined on the fact that you have this impression? So your subjectivity to grading somebody is like partially determined by that? I think it's a and um and for me personally no because um I give everybody one. <laughs> that means you like everybody. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um no, so I think so I think part of that is um it would be hard to say that no, like certain perceptions or whatever don't don't come into play, especially when I've already admitted that there's a level of subjectivity. But I think there are ways around them. For example, like if you did an essay, you could grade by 800. Right. Like at which point I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I I'm really bad at people's names anyway. Like I literally don't. Like I tried, and I just there's too many students, and I just I don't. Right. So part of the part of it is that you can you can you know control for any sort of bias, right? But I'll be. I mean, like let's be real for a minute. Like you can tell from a paper, English. You guys do that. I know you do this. Where you sit down, and you're just like you look at a stack of papers. You get 20, 30 of them, and you can literally, you flip through and you're like, oh, this one has subheadings. This awesome. This one's already going to be at a higher grade than the rest. I, like, you look at it, you're just like, yeah, this one has, like, I can read the first page of a paper that I've assigned, and I'm like, oh, is there a thesis statement? Is there a, is there a, a, a line of, uh, of reasoning in the introduction? Awesome. Now, what, should I just assume that well, the rest, like they, they were, this is all like sort of like those uh, uh, evolved fish that have like sort of like a light, right? That like there's a light and it's just like distracting me. Like, oh, the first page is great and then the rest is all just like wing dings, right? Like, no, like actually, like that, that first page is probably you know, indicative of the rest of the page. Of course, you should read it, but you get, you know, you can look at everybody 15, 20 pages, you're just like, yeah, these papers, right? Some look like Bs and some just right off the bat. Some like now is this really a C minus or is this like a C? Okay, sure. We can there's a level of subjectivity, but if I had to like literally lump, I could lump pretty well A, Bs, and Cs and then F. So the theory is college doesn't teach you things. Okay. Or at least not how to learn things. Yes. Not how to learn problem solving. You're just picking up material. You are who you are by this point. If you're a B student when you come in first class, you're B student the rest of your life, basically. I, I think that college affirms that your abilities that you learn from the time that. you're in preschool or kindergarten to read the teacher, you got to read the teacher just like you have to read your parents. Yeah. Read the teacher, figure out what they want, and give them what they want. And that's that's a measure of success. <clears throat> the measure of success with your future bosses, with your future spouses, read people. You've got to read people and give them what they want. All right. So we are going to move on, but we have time for a couple of comments from the audience. Let's go ahead. Yeah. So what do you learn to read? Where do you learn to earlier, learn? Earlier. It's elementary school. And where do you learn to learn? The day you're born. The day you're born. I mean, there's some weird, that's some weird metaphysical stuff. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know. I have a four and a half year old, and I'm just like, what, like, try to try to imagine teaching somebody to read. Um, you never really should, like, you're like, when did they get, when did they really learn how to read? It's like, well, I don't know. They, at some point, they were just reading. I got a graph for this, how the machine learning works later on. <laughs> <laughs> if we were only, only we were machines. But yeah, well, yes. they are. yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to move on. Actually, yes, I saw another comment. And, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, uh, does it like university itself care if you really work? Because you're going to like, is the institution. You're paying us to have this. I mean, I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, because if you if you learn enough to get out and get a good job and succeed, then you'll donate back to the then university. Some. Some. I think the institution, I mean again, I think we're moving further away, but I do think the institution on some non-negotiable level does care about what it's producing. Like it's it's a product. You're a product, right? I mean, like part you know, they, they care about they care about the product that they're we were producing. We're the producers, right? They're the product, right? And and so I think, but do I think that it it doesn't sit around consciously thinking about whether or not you are succeeding? That's sort of brought down to the our level, right? As individual faculty and 
staff members and stuff. But I think on a broad level, yeah, I think the institution does care. I think they also have other priorities though too. Right? But I also think too that that it isn't just about you know alumni giving back to the university. That's important. But we like to hold up our successful graduates, our successful alums, and say, look, here's an alum who went on to be you know the governor of you know blah 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 or to be the CEO of blah 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 or you know whatever. So you know so those students who learn well or just have it in them to be successful regardless of what they learned here. You know, we like to hold them up because that helps us bring in more customers in the future, right? Like, oh, if you come here, you can be in the, in the MBA as well, you know, like something like that. So, um, yeah. I don't care if you're, uh, if, if you learn, but I do care if you're happy. <laughs> is that what AI says or is that what? <laughs> you can't tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're going to go on to a new topic. I have one topic up here, but I do encourage you to maybe uh, write more on index cards if you'd like to have some other topics. The topic that I'd like um, to debate, and we can actually move to a different format where all three of you have to just choose a side, and then I will, um, you know, uh, start putting in, in your arguments into the, to the prompt and then have the AI debate against you um, from a different side. Um, but here is the prompt from the audience. Um, in light of the president's email today, and that is Stetson's, uh, or the provost, I guess, um, should campus freedom of speech be supported? Should campus freedom of speech be supported? So I'm going to give time to the panel to choose a side um, and then start developing some arguments, and then I'll start putting your arguments over the top. Yeah, I'm just going to share. Pretty straight, so. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know if you. I don't know. I didn't read the whole thing, but I know that. I know that he, uh, there's a level of like fire and it's coming from ICUP, right? Mm -hmm. So, the whole thing. yeah. Let's we'll take one side. Yeah, okay. we have to pick a side. Mm -hmm. well, What's the most interesting side? Say no. Yeah, no freedom. Yeah. No freedom because, yeah, people can get hurt. Yeah, when you come on campus, you only talk about your classes. Yeah, you can't talk about First of all, Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. They do that at some Korean companies, you know. I mean, they used to. Yeah, that's good. All right, so we're gonna take we're gonna take that college campuses should not yeah. embrace. We should stick to our textbooks and our syllabi. The approved right. textbooks. We should cancel all speech. You should cancel all speech. No, no, no debates. No, all right. So now that you have chosen the sides, yeah, now that we have the yeah. professor of the panel that has debate to end debate, we can start to develop some of your arguments. Us. And we should? Yeah, just go ahead and continue to talk. I'm going to engineer the prompts for us. So, okay. So we're taking the side that we shouldn't have freedom of speech on campus. Right. All right. So do we want to take that to mean that? Well, one, it's more efficient. All the small talk and all that junk that takes time. Yes. Okay. It facilitates learning. You're not distracted with other thoughts. It's good. Okay, so but 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 what about the sort of splitting hairs like do if professors are teaching things, are we going to have our freedoms to teach whatever we want to teach restricted because it's still within the confines of the course? Like, oh, I can't talk about climate change because somebody might be upset about that. Um, but it's still part of the course material. So you know, or you're in a social justice class and you can't talk about racism or, you know, things like that. What if, so, we, take, what if we take the hard line that if any student is on class, we Right. Okay, so if you'd ever talk about gender <laughs> issues, we never do. Invite her to issue. So we Political basically. science, political science is so gone. We've been <laughs> like 90% of the Exactly is hard. I think I'm <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like let's, let's actually take the line that we believe that there should not be freedom on campus, freedom of speech on campus, because we take seriously more or less the, the kind of quasi hippocratic oath of like do no harm. Okay. And so any speech that could do harm, okay. both direct and indirect. Okay. So anything can trigger anybody. So we yes. should just be silent. So well, we should just learn by being silent. Well, well we can't, be, we can't, like, I think implicit, like everybody knows. Or is explicit, but there's like a range of things that are acceptable, okay. like what our country. Well, learning, learning is already a self. So whatever the government says, yeah. we can teach. That That's country. what's allowed. So there's that, okay. but then there's also we just talked about how learning is totally subjective. Uh, so it's just whatever you already thought. Okay, so basically, what it's students is. are teaching us. 
They're coming in well, with whatever they already believe. They just put that on the table right. in the classroom and then everybody would sit. Okay. Yeah, in fact, it's not, it's not, it's all self learning is just self reflection. Okay. That's it. All that is is that you basically come in and you write or read or whatever it is on your own, in your own capacity, coerced in no way, and reported and evaluated in no way. Okay. Yeah, because grades are. Yes, because grades are. Who knows what that is? And then the subjective evaluation, we have to make sure that that doesn't become a fence, right? And so the only thing well, that we're grading and evaluating. It's like a uniform random distribution. Yes, that's I mean, it's just totally random. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a weird bell curve almost, but okay. Right? Uh, so I think that's our view of, of you, you remember that Kurt Vonnegut story where uh, in the future, they judge the price of art by spinning a wheel. And, you know, there's drawing of a cat that was like worth minutes. And, you know, whatever, it's at least fair. I love it. Then it turns out the scandal was the guy who did the spinning rigged it. Yeah. So I think we should just have a random number generator. That like part of your grade is literally just a function that somebody who's not. But it, I, mean, I mean, the system is already rigged. So and I mean, it's already rigged, you know, waiting towards the, you know, the white male, right. cis, cis white males. I mean, you know, you guys are already heavily weighted. Turns out. As it turns out. Yeah. So, yeah, let's maintain that. Well, that's why the ancient Greeks, right? Like they talked about democracy by law, right? So, basically, right. what we do is we like the A's are just like the most fair that you can have them is any, everyone has an equal probability of both passing and failing every class. Okay. Right. So, if your last so, name is an A, you get an A? No, 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 We'll have a random number generator and it will say this many, these numbers got A's. Okay, but no one has to write. So, what about three numbers? Hold on, I'm saying okay. that, that's for tech reading. Um, oh, all right, so you're all on the same side. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's, here's the AI. Well, 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 it looks like our panel of professors is taking the side of limiting campus freedom yes. of speech. How very conservative of them. <laughs> But fear not, dear students, for I am here to argue for the importance of free speech on campus. First off, let's get one thing straight. The right to free speech is a cornerstone of democracy. Without it, we can't have a meaningful debate and discourse in a society with all the forward for it. As a great philosopher John Stuart Mill once said, all mankind minus one were of one opinion. Mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. Secondly, limiting freedom of speech on campus is a slippery slope towards censorship and authoritarianism. Who gets to decide what can and cannot be said? And who is to say that controversial or uncomfortable speech is not important for fostering critical speaking and intellectual growth? As scholar Jonathan Rauch has argued, the point of free speech is not to reward the speaker, but to empower the listener. And finally, let's not forget that colleges and universities have historically been at the forefront of social and political change. From the civil rights movement to the, uh, to the Me Too movement, not the MOVE movement, um, students and faculty on campus have played a vital role in advocating for justice and progress. Limiting free speech on campus is antithetical to this tradition of activism and dissent. If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. That's what it says. That's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, what's the um, portal that we're supposed to use when we feel triggered to report this? Right, is that what's called? Please don't report it. <laughs> Yeah, right. so, I mean, isn't, isn't that kind of um, service that our that our community has to use? Isn't that actually a limit of free speech? I guess it depends what happens next after the report. Well, let's go back to who gets to determine what's said there. So, I mean, is the is the so we we've, we've come on the side of well, the institution limits severely. What gets said, or who, who can talk, whatever. Right? Our classroom, where you're just writing reflections on your own, right? Your own sense of meaning, whatever that is, right? Um, and you're evaluated on how well you were able, and not even well, just that you, I suppose, right? Wrote things. Um, so who gets to determine? So the response is, well, you're trying to limit, and who gets to draw that line? Is is the AI's position then that there is no limit to free speech like that is we can have the, the, uh, does hate speech can, can we yeah. hate, hate speech yeah so i mean so number one is just where's the, where's the line right yeah what's up oh yeah and then and then there was something about um john some some quote to john Stuart mill about some silencing the one silencing the one or i guess there's also like the marketplace of ideas kind of approach 
how many things like how, when you talk about like the irony of ironies is you know at the back end when it talked about the history the historical importance of universities and like the civil rights movement <laughs> it wasn't through it wasn't through just merely talking was it right was it through the was it through the marketplace of ideas that the civil rights movement was most effective is that what they did or was it when they when this college students got on buses and drove down to the south and actually forcibly right registered people so i'm, I'm just confused on like the idea that oh the, the the marketplace of ideas can produce and and because of the marketplace of ideas that's why universities were so good at social change so i just i would want to totally decouple that that argument i think that's uh, again a slight of hand by chat gpt that makes sense you know like chat gp it produces one solution pick out three quotations which are partially relevant yeah and then you know, sort of other points still break brief sentences sort of right but didn't make an argument make yeah. a claim and like slap down three quotations right, right. that's it yeah. so it's weird like like you're making these arguments back right yeah. it's like you're, you're playing tennis against the wall <laughs> yeah well just like oh that's what i'm saying you're, you're, you're from the engineer yeah. university administrator she's like here's my package answer and also here's, here's more thinking this is the conservative aspect of yeah. chat gpt which is just an appeal all of it was just more or less an appeal to authority either by name or through some sort of like feel-goodery aphorism like you're not paying attention, right? You're you're not outraged. You're not paying attention. What did that? What do that mean? Like I'm I'm outraged. <laughs> I barely pay attention to anything. <laughs> so what is, so what does this mean, right? So I I I think ChatGPT here is since it trained on our own produced text. Yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> all are called ultimate. I will have, uh, I will have more to say from the AI's perspective, but I do have a question from the audience, which is what would be the punishment for breaking? Uh, the speech. How would there be innovation? Um, what punishments might there be? Or you know, you're on the side of, of saying we should limit free speech. How would you punish people to do that? Probation or expulsion. Yes, yeah, so expulsion. Depending on the best. I mean, yeah. they just change the grade. We don't do that. We lost that level. We don't. We don't do 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 so. Well, they still have to pay for four years. Oh, they just okay. no longer. They just are ineligible for. Play grade at the end. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> But at the end, at the end, we we hold all we hold basically again. We, we surprise them at the end of their four years. They paid all their tuition. They were just like, oh, by the way, three and a half years ago, you said this to somebody who thought it was offensive. So in your first week, in your first week during you know, and, and maybe it wasn't even you. I don't know. But by the way, you've been you were expel, expelled then. Thank you. Back like when when you decided it was going to be. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Random number generator said you you failed. Right. So. Right. So here is a response. Ah, uh, yes, the age-old question: Where is the line when it comes to free speech? Yeah. Well, my esteemed panel of professors, I hate to break it to you, but the line is actually pretty clear. It's called the law. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good. Let's get into the now. The, 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 we have the a little something called, called the First Amendment, oh. which protects our right to free speech, yeah, okay. but also has limitations on speech that incites violence or is a direct threat to others. As for the marketplace of ideas not being enough, well, that's that's just a load of baloney. The whole point of a marketplace of ideas is that the best ideas rise to the top in the process of debate, discussion, thing. critical thinking. And as scholar Robert Paz has argued, free speech protects not just us speakers, but the broader public interest in a vibrant and robust place. These are all ideas. And don't even get me started on Wendy's idea of punishing free speech with expulsion. That's like saying we should punish people for exercising their basic human rights. It's also been shown that punishment is not an effective way to promote positive behavioral change. As researcher Alfie Cohn has argued, punishment doesn't teach self-discipline, it teaches resentment, rebellion, and avoidance. So the marketplace, of, so the marketplace of ideas is such a capitalist perspective. Yeah, wow. It really is. And, and so and, and, you know, and you can kind of translate that into like evolution and survival of the fittest, right? You know, like you know, the best idea wins, whatever. And yet that's not always true. That's not always true. Sometimes bad ideas win. Sometimes bad ideas are winning. Right today in our in our politics, in our communities, bad ideas are winning. Why? Because they're self-serving to a group of people in power. That's it. I mean, again, Chad GPT said marketplace of ideas and then said, yeah, well, the, the point of the marketplace of ideas is this. I didn't deny that. I just said, again, it, it doesn't obtain. So I, I don't like, yeah, this is 
great. That would if it did obtain, awesome. But if it didn't, if it doesn't, which it doesn't, then you can't keep just saying, well, the market about place of ideas, right? So I don't I, and then it's just to be clear. I didn't, you know, it's not me. <laughs> Joel's point. Um, Chat GPT ever come up with anything new? Ooh, okay. I'll ask it then. Because I mean, yeah, all we're doing right now is just spewing existing quotes and other people's ideas. Isn't what we're really trying to teach students to do is come up with your own ideas, well, use other sources and, to to help build new ideas, but to actually have something novel to think and say. So, Wendy, there's actually a temperature parameter. Okay. Put temperature at zero, it sticks with the same answer. Okay. And you increase temperature to like one or so. The way it works is that, right, it, not right, what did I say that? It chooses the next word based on the prior word. Oh. It's been trained how to do that because you have godly amounts of text on the internet and everything that have words after words. Mm -hmm. And so it trains on what's the next word. So while it's figuring out the next word, it's doing a search, keeping like 10 ideas in mind. And finding the most probabilistic word from the prior. Uh -huh. And so that's how it builds its answer. If you turn up temperature, it won't always choose the best. So you get different things, and it's so much dictated by the prompt as well. I mean, that's the only reason it's so snarky, is because he must be doing something. That's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am I'm definitely I'm I'm definitely pushing the model to respond yeah. to you in kind, um, such that uh, you know it will take your uh, arguments into account, but then try to produce the most, um, let's say, uh, I don't know, controversial or polemicist view uh, in, against what you might be saying, which is what you also, as a panel, I will remind you, um, were asked to do as well, right? Just, just take a side and defend it, whether you agree with it or not. I, I hope you don't agree that we should like limit free speech on the campus. We're all um, actors up here. We're just yes, we're all just actors. Yes. I'm not even just the stage. Right. Um, so, but the other thing though, again, the political science would be like to say that there's a law that adjudicates this of which there's the first amendment. I would remind ChatGPT that the protections of the first amendment are, well, it's a private institution for one, but like number two are, have been contingently defined throughout our history to include or not include certain groups, certain acts, certain people, right? So I just, to, 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 to and that's why I, I made the comment about it being more or less like authoritarian. It's just like, well, there's a law, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. It's, actually, they, it's response to that is, yeah. is not very good. It says, um, well, let me tell you, my dear professors, that sometimes the tried and true methods are the best ones. So yes, this kind of like, okay. uh, just after I'm sure they are. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, great. Um, okay, so I think that uh, is maybe a good point to maybe just wrap up this part of the debate. So any sort of final thoughts, either from our panel, um, I'll maybe have the AI do any sort of final thought, and then anyone in the audience uh, will, will feel free to do that. And then we'll have a, a short sort of uh, segment for voter um, registration, and then we'll turn it over to Josh to show us how this whole thing kind of is working. So any final thoughts? Uh, take away your freedom of speech. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we should turn it over to the audience first. Freedom of speech. Yes. Freedom. Well, uh, to connect into the I cuff like letter, um, it was more so about the government controlling or uh, mandating what uh, universities can uh, teach. Right. So, if you guys are on the side of limiting speech, well, how would you argue that? How would you hypothetically? Argue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how would you guys argue that uh, it's, the government should? Influence you mean perhaps for sake of argument, private students as well, what they can't not teach. How would they enforce it? You said, or you think that's right? Or oh, if it's right, yeah. Well, one simple, I mean, again, look, without getting to political science about it, but like the ability for the ability for a place like Stetson to exist is through a, basically a government understanding and a charter, so forth and so on, at, uh, allowed uh, that allows Stetson to operate, right? Because the state says, oh, by the way, we actually care about education, right? We also, allow, so we have a whole justification for public schools, right? Because the state has an invested interest in having a certain kind of citizen. I mean, you go back to like Wisconsin v. Yoder Supreme Court case, that justification for the idea uh, of like more or less opening the door for homeschool was actually the state does have an interest in producing a certain kind, normatively, a certain kind of citizen, right? Well, the charter, more or less the understanding is 
that the charter of a private university to function in the state of Florida, right, is coming out of the state's recognition that they have a, they have a responsibility to have an educated citizen, right? So, the, and then they're allowing, right? They're saying, oh, well, we, we can do this, but we're going to allow you, a private institution, to do this as well. So you can operate because you're still fulfilling what it is that we want normatively of our citizens to do to think, to look like, right? And so the response there is actually maybe, right? The the state could just be like, well, you either you either do what it is that we we as a state elected officials think is most important for our citizens in Florida to to think and act and you know, believe, right? Or you don't, at which point you probably lose your charter. You're probably going to lose Bright Future, which actually is losing the charter, probably not. Bright Futures, I do believe, is actually on the cutting, on the chopping block for private institutions. And so heads up. Yeah, and always, these, like, always all, I mean, so heads up. Like this is that like in, in as much as like this is part of a performance of joke, that's a real thing, by the way. Like the Florida government is uh, is putting uh, those things on the chopping block for private institutions. And so if we can get those fellowship dollars, we can get the students who require those fellowship dollars to be able to afford to come here. Right. And and then yeah. so there's that. That's what they do. They take away the scholarship money for the students. They, in a public system, you know, whether that's K-12 or in a public university, they can actually call for the, for the firing of individual teachers who are teaching things that are outside of the, yeah. you know, the prescribed curriculum. So, yeah. So that's why you should vote. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And also in public institutions um, where, the, where the board of trustees for that institution is appointed by, say, the governor. This happened at New College last month. Um, the governor can go in and and basically get rid of all the old board of trustees and appoint new ones, and then change out who the president is, and then change out everything. So regulatory capture. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's a good segue, I suppose, to uh, voter registration. Do we have uh, someone here from the voter registration? I said that we're going to talk. Oh. Y'all should pinky promise. To register. Yes, register to vote. We just did it. Um, I will read this last part from chat GPT before I hand it over to Josh to show us how this whole thing works. Um, as we wrap up this town hall conversation, let me leave you with one final thought on freedom of speech on campus. It's easy to get bogged down in the details. What constitutes hate speech? Where's the line between free speech and censorship and so on? But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to remember why we value free speech in the first place. We value free speech because it allows us to explore new ideas, challenge the status quo, and advocate for change. We value free speech because it empowers us to think critically, to question authority, and to engage in meaningful discourse with others. And we value free speech because it is essential to creating a society that is just, fair, and equitable for all. So let us not forget the power of our words, and let us always strive to use that power for good. Let us listen to those with different opinions, engage in respectful debate, and work together to build a better future. And let us never forget that the right to free speech is not just a privilege, but a responsibility, one that we must use wisely and with care. So vote for me. <laughs> Chat GPT. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, Josh, let's turn it over to you. Yes, you see this? We're all good? Okay. Chat GPT, how AI chatbots work, and respond to prompts. I kind of gave a generic author, but that should be fine. All right, ChatGPT is an AI chatbot that uses natural language processing, NLP, to understand and respond to human language. AI chatbots are becoming increasingly popular in various industries, including customer service, healthcare, and education, as you know. ChatGPT is trained on a large data set of human conversations, allowing it to generate responses that are contextually relevant and grammatically correct. AI chatbots like ChatGPT have potential to improve customer engagement and satisfaction while also saving businesses time and money. By 2024, the global chatbot market is expected to reach 9.4 billion, driven by increasing demand for automated customer service. ChatGPT uses an encoder decoder architecture to generate responses to user prompts. So the encoder takes in uh, the user's input and converts it into a numerical representation. And the decoder then uses the numerical representation to generate the response. This process allows ChatGPT to generate responses that are contextually relevant and grammatically correct, making it a useful tool for natural language processing tests. The ChatGPT encoder decoder architecture allows it to generate responses that are not only contextually relevant and grammatically correct, but also creative and humorous 
making it a fun and engaging chatbot to interact with. Yes. ChatGPT learns from conversations and data using a technique called unsupervised learning. And uh, this involves training the model to large amounts of data without explicit labels or feedback. This allows ChatGPT to learn patterns and relationships in the data, which can be used to generate more accurate responses. By continually learning from new data, ChatGPT can improve its performance and stay up to date with changing language patterns. And ChatGPT's unsupervised learning approach enables it to learn from vast amounts of data without explicit feedback. And that allows it to generate contextually relevant to accurate responses, making it one of the most advanced chatbots available. Prompts, prompts are used to guide ChatGPT's response generation. ChatGPT uses a transformer-based architecture to process prompts and generate responses. The transformer architecture allows ChatGPT to generate more coherent and contextually relevant responses. The quality of the prompt is crucial for generating high quality responses. And the quality of the prompt is actually a key factor in determining the quality of ChatGPT's responses. Well-crafted prompts lead to more informative and engaging responses, while poorly crafted prompts can result in irrelevant or nonsensical responses. And effective prompts provide clear and specific information for ChatGPT to generate a relevant response. Ineffective prompts lack context and specificity, leading to irrelevant or nonsensical responses. Um, examples of effective prompts include asking for a definition, providing a scenario, asking for an opinion on a specific topic. Examples of the ineffective prompts include a yes or no question, providing incomplete information, or using unclear language. According to OpenAI, the quality of the prompt is the most critical factor in determining the quality of ChatGPT's responses making it essential to craft clear and specific prompts for optimal results. Studies have shown that effective prompts can improve response accuracy and quality up to 30%, while ineffective prompts can decrease it uh, by up to 50%. All right, so ChatGPT does have limitations in understanding context, sarcasm, and emotions, which can lead to inaccurate or inappropriate responses. The use of ChatGPT raises ethical concerns about data privacy bias and the potential for misuse. To ensure ethical and responsible practices, transparency and accountability are necessary in development and use of ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT's limitations in understanding context, sarcasm, and emotions can lead to inaccurate or inappropriate responses, highlighting the need for ongoing research and development and natural language processing to improve accuracy and and um, ChatGPT and AI chatbots have the potential to revolutionize customer service and support, providing personalized and efficient assistance. And with further development, ChatGPT could be used in mental health and therapy applications, providing accessible and affordable support. And ChatGPT and AI chatbots could also be utilized in language translation, making communication across languages more accessible and efficient. ChatGPT and AI chatbots could include advancements in emotion recognition and response, leading to more human-like interactions. AI chatbots are increasingly being used in the education sector to provide personalized learning experiences and support for students. For example, an AI chatbot called Jill Watson was used at Georgia Tech in a course to answer student questions and provide feedback. Many students not realizing that they are interacting with a chatbot rather than a human teaching assistant. Thanks for suffering through that. <laughs> what a program that generates PowerPoints with ChatGPT. And every word I read was from that program. <laughs> <laughs> I literally only gave it this prompt. It was a seven minute PowerPoint I wanted for a general audience. And I have a PowerPoint at the end. I only applied a theme in Google Slides. So I plan to extend this work to uh, add photos and um, maybe some diagrams and some tables of fake data and see where we are after that. So contact me if you would like to automate some of your job. <laughs> <laughs>
Can you load up the second one? Uh, to do the farce or review the farce? Homework. Absolutely. So now I'm going to give you the real presentation, which is shorter and hopefully less annoying. <laughs> like very like no, very, <laughs> very tedious. Yeah, narrated. Narrated. Yeah, I don't read notes. Yeah. Second one. <laughs> second one. Uh, let me try. Oh, now we're back. Eighty. Yeah, you can. I I could just use my screen on this one. Share it here. I don't have to do um. Oh, okay. You don't have to do that. Notes. <laughs> don't really need notes. Okay. So. Uh, I guess I'll stay up here. Or you can, yeah, no, it'll be good. Okay, so that's what it thinks it does, which is fine. But here's what I really wanted to say. Okay, so why, how does it learn language at all? I'm not going to go into details, obviously. Uh, I do teach an AI class in fall if you want to join. But uh, generally, at the highest, well, this is really the lowest level. How does it know what words mean? We take a neural net, that's the box in the middle. Don't worry about how neural nets work, but they learn something. And we feed it a bunch of text without any marking on it of what the answer is. We just look, we just grab text, literally 45 terabytes of text is what GPT is trained on. And we go through all five letter sequence of words. We just slide across the text. We take the first two words and the last two words as input to the network, the mind or whatever, and it's forced to come up with a prediction of what was missing. So it learns parameters. In ChatGPT, it's 175 billion parameters. It learns what the numbers need to be to interpret these and produce that. The effect is, other words that could fit in the middle that you find in other sentences, like pineapples are pokey and yellow, pokey and spiky will turn out to have the same or the very close num numeric representation because the context is almost identical in every use. So it learns a, a vector of about 4,000 or 1,500 numbers instead of using the original word. So it learns the words ahead of time. So you now have a new representation for words. Uh, if you're doing this direction or that direction, it's basically the same. So on the second one, take that word and predict all the words that would appear next to it. Yes. So you mentioned it's trained on 45 terabytes of data. Um, well, and where do they get a bit of to, I don't know, like chat GPT, for example, and it's filtered. Certain yeah. Do they filter the data before it's put in? I don't know if they filtered the data before it's put in. I'm sure they're collecting data sets that they know are good, but you don't get 45 terabytes by collecting it. There's a thing called common crawl, which has been yeah. crawling the internet for like 10 years. And uh, all of Wikipedia, all of Google books, right? Google scans books. They have books from 1800s and stuff. That's all sucked in. Uh, they, um, what was I gonna say about that? So they're crawling, oh yes, these advancements, this AI advancement would not have existed or been possible without social media. So all the stuff you're posting is fed into this. The stuff that does the image recognition or whatever, I'll show you an example. That's using your photos. Your, when you tag someone on Facebook or Instagram, or I don't know how Instagram works, but you tag people, you are feeding the beast. Every time it says, are you human? Where are the stoplights? You're feeding the beast. That's where it's coming from. The challenge is going to be to train the next model I read a report about this. There isn't another 45 terabytes sitting around. So where do we get the better model if we don't have more stuff? The other problem is half the stuff you're going to be seeing on the internet is produced by these models. And so it's basically training on its own information. Um, I think it's filtered after because I read a report today about yeah. uh, the bug bounty. No, but I do have a slide about how they do the after filtering. Well, they, I guess someone... First bug bounty chat GPT, they had it uh, great malware to bypass Yes. Um, as I understand this, that would mean since the uh, let's take the US and other advanced countries uh -huh. tend to be inputting more information through social media, 
it's really contributing to non-inclusiveness, right? Because Spanky is just as we have concerned with the SAT. Yeah, absolutely. Spanky has a meaning in a certain culture, has a certain meaning, but not in certain other cultures. It's learning bias is all over the place. Excuse me? It's learning bias is all over the place. Yeah. Now, um, I don't have a bunch of slides on this or anything, but one thing that there's there's plenty of research. I'll show a slide about how much research has happened in the three months since this has existed, but there is research about how to make it less biased. And one of the things you do, it's called in-context learning. In the prompt where you say, I want you to do X, Y, Z, you give it an example. And I didn't read the full paper yet, but I think they say, um, for example, uh, you tell it like, I don't know what they told it, but they gave an example of like not being biased. Uh, women can be nurses, but men can be nurses too. And some other things like that. Then they measured the bias of its outputs and it was dramatically less biased. So if you give it a few examples, it'll use those. But if you only reflect on the trainings that it has, it's gonna reflect the society it comes from. When China, so you got China, Russia, um, some other companies are trying to come up with their own version of this. And in China, I saw a report that there's just not enough text out there that's like open source text that you can just get to train it as effectively as this one's been trained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all adds up. So the the number is representing the words that start to look like this. So you get, if you were to plot it, cat and kitten will be next to each other, for example. Now this thing, I got a better graphic for this. This is phenomenal. If you look at the distance in a vector space of man to woman, you get a, a direction and a magnitude. You apply that to the word king, it gives you the word queen. So it, it learned analogies simply by the thing I just showed you. Here's another analogy. And it's learning these kinds of things too. When you don't label your data as this is the answer, there's no way to tell if it's working well. So you train on all these words and okay, spiky is the answer, it's training on that, but now does it produce pokey? Is, that, is it supposed to produce pro, pokey? I don't know. The way they test if this thing is working is they have a bank of analogies. It's like SAT analogies. And you run those through the system. If it gets the analogies right, like man is a woman, as king is the blank, they call that a hit and you get a score for your system. So unlike face recognition where you say this is the face and you mark that and you say you should produce the same answer, the only way to test this performance is by analogy. That looks terrible. Um, I don't know what that is up there. Okay. <laughs> so that was, a, uh, it's called word to back. It's like a base approach. On top of that is a thing called BERT, which comes from this paper, Attention is All You Need. This is paper from 2017. It has 67,000 citations as of today. That, it's an almost exponential growth of citations. This paper was from Google, and ironically, Google dropped the ball and didn't create ChatGPT, even though they created the tech that's behind ChatGPT. Uh, a startup company, OpenAI, that kind of splintered off, created ChatGPT. Um, so, when I look at these citation numbers, it's unparalleled in other sciences. If you, if you allow us to be a science, this would be unparalleled. Maybe the Bible is more citations, but so the way attention is all you need works. The reason it's all you need is because it, it, it's a long story, but it takes each word and simultaneously learns what are the words that tell you something about that word in a, in a use, right, in a sentence. So some words like separator, they don't really have any implication, but crawled and slowly seem to be related. Rabbit and hopped are related. It runs across the sentences and learns what to focus on to make sense of the words. So it's, it's the next level of making sense of language. That paper is like, cannot be overstated how uh, impactful this paper is. As far as citations, it's a related phenomenon before, well, that same year, actually, big year. Um, you all know that you can ask various AI systems to recognize objects. Like I have a phone app that recognizes plants, you know? Um, the paper, we call it AlexNet from the dude Alex, who's the first author. He's a grad student at the time. His paper has 128,000 citations. And it was the first one, one of the first ones that blew up the whole deep learning idea. Now we're just like, everybody's just scrambling to figure out the implications. 
So this is still obviously huge research doing images. And you can see still last year, 40,000 citations. Now, if you want to compare, let's look at the rest of science. Top 100 cited papers of all time, at least as of 2014. First most cited paper of all time is this one, and it had 300,000. If the trend continues with the two papers I just showed, they're probably going to beat it in a year or two. And it's from 51. The second most cited paper of all time is this one in Nature from 1970. There's no single year where you get as many citations as the papers I just showed you. And we're already competing for the position. We, I'm not part of this, but <laughs> <laughs> your science folk are competing for position three, the most cited paper of all time, and it's five years old. Yes. It's interesting, um, just point of transparency. So I'm a biochemist. Every one of the papers that you just cited was mandatory. We had to, we had to have those, we had to use the methods of the papers, create and then they see it in the stuff. That's like, you know, yeah, yeah, family, effort, everything, those three that you show, you weren't going to get your, you weren't going to get a PhD in my study. If you for sure. <laughs> yeah, what's, <laughs> no, I was just going to say, that's actually a good point, how they get their numbers up. Um, uh, I think I got another, well, have you heard of archive.org? ARXIV.org. It's not for all the sciences, really, but for these. First of all, so this paper was in the communications of ACM, but you'll find papers. Uh, this one was originally just on archive.org. It was eventually published in NeurIPS, but um, you put something on archive.org and other, and it's no peer review. It's just you decide to put it up there and it's up there. It'll get tens of thousands of citations if it's important, just from archive. It's never actually been published in here, never peer reviewed. It's just effective and people start citing it. So these numbers are dramatically boosted by the fact that there is just so much research on archive.org that cites this paper. You guys have to publish in legit journals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you were using those papers, like, uh, you couldn't buy, you couldn't purchase commercially a lot of. Things that we use, so we had to make it. Oh, so you had to see the paper. Yeah, that's interesting. I could just download "Attention is All You Need" code, but I think so. The citations are still papers, at least on archives. Like somebody's writing something. Sixty-five thousand, sixty-seven thousand different cases of that. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but just the basic, the next level, which is ChatGPT, how it works. It starts with what we just talked about. Attention is all you need, so it knows what to focus on and which words matter in the paragraph. But they also add in the next thing, they hired a lot of people. And by the way, people in Kenya, it was reported to a lot of the filtering, uh, figuring out what's a good non-biased or non-offensive response. And they quit in mass recently because it was like such atrocious conditions. So a lot of that's still going on um, behind the scenes. All the AI companies probably have something like that going on. Um, uh, they choose something that they're asking it, then they produce what they think would be a good answer. And then it is used by the AI system to kind of learn, okay, that's a good answer. Then they ask it a similar question again, and it picks, it kind of comes up with its own answers, like it with attention is all you need, that kind of thing. And then humans rank them and it learns how to rank itself. Now that it can rank itself, it just, uses its own idea of, it grades itself. And um, that's what we have today. So obviously there's no one watching what you're typing anymore. From people training it how to rank itself, it now ranks itself and produces best answers. So that's what they've added. And uh, can you do this yourself? I was asked a couple of weeks ago if the government like DARPA could do this themselves, could they train it themselves? And the answer is no because you don't have that much text and you don't have, uh, I just read a paper by Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt and another guy, they estimate it takes a billion dollars to train this thing. Just for the hardware probably and the human in the loop part. The hardware 
175 billion parameters, you can't even load that without having like 16 GPUs, like the good ones that are $5,000 a piece. You can't even bring the model up and type into it without paying that much. And that's why this will only be the huge companies that can do this. Microsoft gave OpenAI a ton of money. That's why it's in Bing, so forth. That's why Google is scrambling. It's been out for about three months. There are 5,000 papers already about it. Don't read the titles too closely. <laughs> um, I'll give you a minute to read the titles. <laughs> <laughs> Journal of Applied Learning and Teaching. I'll put it this way. If you want a publication ASAP, write about ChatGPT. Have you done that? I'm working on it. <laughs> Actually, I got one abstract already accepted for our conference, like a presentation on a publication. And I have two abstracts that might be papers. So, yes. Uh, okay. This is what blows every blows. This is what is blowing everybody's mind, the researchers' mind. This paper. This is the last, like this slide, and I think one more. This paper is called "The Emergent Abilities of Large Language Models," which ChatGPT is one. There are other large language models. There's various ways to measure its accuracy, like um, question answering, unscrambling words, doing arithmetic. As you increase the amount that's trained on, how much input and how long you train it, you get linear increase in performance and then something happens. And they don't know why this is happening. This is why you see it today and not last year being so freaking good, because they only got this big recently. And because it takes so much money and so much input. And so, so there is a unlinear, surprising, emergent phenomenon where these models suddenly can do arithmetic, suddenly can answer questions, suddenly can um, do natural language understanding, word and context, all these like producing truthful question answering and so forth. Transliteration of IPA format, like of the pronunciations and so on. Various metrics, crazy performance that only occurred last year. And so I was just at a conference, a huge talk, uh, conference with like 1700 papers presented, AI conference, like one of the biggest ones. One of the keynotes was from this guy who works at Microsoft Research and his talk was a physics of AI. How do we make a physics of AI? Because we don't know how it works. And so we're gonna have to start probing it. We take a little thing off of its feature. Does it do worse? We add a little thing here, does it do better? We can't actually look at the code and say, this is why it works. We have to now probe it like it's a black box, like we're studying some population out in the wild to figure out why that those graphs turned out the way they did. And so the beginning of his talk was, he talked about you know, how it's trained, a trillion tokens, a hundred layers of attention, and nobody knows why it's working. So that's the current state of things. Um, it's an extremely active field. Everybody's like scrambling over each other, knocking each other down to get the next paper on archive.org to be, you know, the one who figured something out. And you see, if you look at the documentation from the company OpenAI about how to get better prompts and have it be more truthful in its answers, they're showing performance jumps of like 27% to 87% just by doing little tricks in your code. There's no other field where you get that kind of growth of accuracy from one little trick. For example, if you're giving it a difficult logic problem and it fails, tell it to go step by step. Just add that to your prompt. It then does one statement and the next statement and the next statement. They've analyzed this. They've done accuracy scores. It's far, far better. The reason is when it produces the first statement, like, oh, this would be the first step I do. That statement actually gets added and it can see it to produce the next statement. And it can see that one to produce the next statement. So it's going smaller steps and it can reflect on what it's come up with so far. So that's one thing, and then doing the in-context learning where it's less biased if you give examples, it's also more truthful if you give it examples. Uh, there's, there's a crazy industry popping up of how to prompt this thing so that it can do completely uh, unexpected things that we haven't seen today. Yes. Question. So we don't know really how it's doing this. Right. Know that the data set got big enough. Yeah. And yet in 2017, that paper comes out, and it's hugely popular. Yeah. Microsoft invests billions of dollars into this so they can get it going. 
and then you have linear performance for the year, and then you just have this emerging. Well, behavior. linear was good. So what is it that led them to feel like this was worth pursuing? For That's a good last question. Few years, given that nobody predicted this, nobody understands it, and yet there was this barrage of money and attention paid to this. Oh, well, I think everybody knows with machine learning, give it more. And there are other models that are bigger than ChatGPT that perform about the same, but they're so much bigger, they're not really worth the extra cost. Um, so um, I think it's just the, the fact it was a nonlinear increase, I think was surprising, but the linear increase was itself worthwhile. And so you see, like with face recognition, with the with the paper at AlexNet paper, the that paper had in its table of data like accuracy scores on some data set, it was 65% correct. And then it was 86 with AlexNet. Like you don't see that. Decades of inching up a percent or two. And then this happened. It's like the Netflix challenge, right? A million dollars would be that what was a percent increase or something yeah. like that. Yeah, those little things. Yeah. Years for, somebody like that, for a team of researchers. Yeah. And so this will eventually settle out and we'll all get used to it. But right now, it is very surprising. All right. So what was do we have anything next? Yeah, we just got QA. Okay. Um, so we do want to turn this over now just to the audience. Um, we've seen a lot. Um, we've we've gone through a lot, but really, uh, as this thing is, the truth is that nobody has a clue what's going on. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that we have like a loss of hope. In fact, maybe it isn't just like a, an individual thing, right? Maybe it's a collective thing. So the reason that Josh and I came together to have this town hall slash debate, which is not really a debate, but we we kind of played along as though it were, um, was to bring all of us together. Right, like we have people from uh, from chemistry, from computer science, from political science, from the environmental sciences. I'm in English for some uh, god awful reason. So you know, uh, what can we do together to really start to understand this? What can we do together as a campus? What do you as students want to see Stetson do and faculty do to help us really um, go forward into this next era of I don't know transformative AI? Um, so yeah, questions, comments, ideas, uh, collaborations, things that you want. Do you think the AI can tell if, like, if I did my homework on ChatGPT and then you created it, do you think it could tell that it created it for me previously? Um, well, the real question is, do you know whether or not you're using the, this? So there is a, yeah. there's, there's two approaches. One, this guy got way too much um, fame for doing nothing really, but there's something called ChatGPT, Chat, Chat Zero. G yeah, GPT Zero. GPT -Zero. I've never tried it, but I've heard it doesn't really work. But the idea is he's basically using ChatGPT to recognize if ChatGPT produced something. Um, I don't think that'll work. Secondly, three things actually. Secondly, OpenAI, the company is exploring, but apparently hasn't done it yet, or they haven't told us, of putting little tricks in its output that are recognizable like a signature. But the third thing is if you want to bypass that, you run its output into a different model, which like a summarization model, you know, there's many models out there and it will change it. And then there you go. Yeah, yeah. this, it actually indexes a larger question about AI ethics, right? Like uh, it, uh, the truth is, is that any sufficiently powerful technology can be used in any way that um, might fool professors, can be used to turn in homework. Um, uh, and then, you know, if you have a sufficiently powerful uh, technology, then you can, you can use it to recognize that. But then the question is like, uh, why would you do either of those things? Why would you want to do that? Uh, what What is, let's say, the role of the human in this? So, uh, we might see more and more seeding of control of humans to things like technology. We already seed a lot of our memory to things like smartphones and reminders and Apple watches to like buzz us if we need to like stand up or something like this. Um, but uh, what are we to do, right? To, to really as humans, as a, as a community, as, as um, people that have like actual relationships that aren't just numerically encoded in some way, what should we do to, um, you know, really benefit us as, as individuals, us as a society, us as a species? Um, these are some things that we should be thinking about as we move forward. Um, yeah. So I work in the writing center and I'm also an English student. And our last meeting, we had like a pseudo debate as well about if we should encourage students to use chat GD, 
whatever, you know, um, with helping with their papers, yeah. especially first year students. And you were kind of like mulling over at what point does it become a detriment or a crutch if it's like helping you synthesize information and at what point is it not your voice anymore? Mm -hmm. um, Steven, you said something yeah. about this the other day. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to hide back there. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're saying maybe flippantly or something, but we were talking about how if they don't, if they turn in a poorly written paper. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm, I'm of the opinion of the political science department, uh, the new word where uh, I fully embrace chat GPT. And I think that what this, what this does is it's kind of, it allows you as a student right, to, to synthesize a piece of information, a piece of writing, and, you know, write, outline a, a paper in a way that you probably never were able to do or help you, like, get through that first sort of writer's block, that kind of thing, right? But I also think that it, it, it's, it, the deal is, you can use it. My view is that you should definitely use it. On, on all writing things, you should definitely use it. Just put it in there, put the prompt in there, put, put what you wrote in there, right? But you have to understand that what that means is that you should never, you have no, no excuse for turning in a paper that's poorly written. You have no excuse for turning in a paper that doesn't have citation. You have no excuse for turning in a paper that's grammatically correct. When minimally, <laughs> all you had to do was take your current paper, copy and paste, and put it in, in ChatGPT. Right? So, I mean, it goes both ways. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that part of it is get back to the, the thing that we, uh, the one paper that was there is about bullshit. It's like, I think a lot of assignments are bullshit. I think a lot of the writing assignments, I mean, but part of the thing about why we did it, when we do that, we did it as a way to kind of force you to do the reading that you don't want to do, right? And so we just grade, we just, we would grade it and look at it and be like, okay, just do the reading, right? You did the reading, plus, right? We, we weren't really looking at your writing or anything like that. On the other hand, right, when we would ask you to write a research paper, you guys would lose your minds because you're like, I don't know how to write this, it's too long, whatever. And I'm like, it's not about the writing. Like, obviously, I care about the writing, but it's also about the idea. What is it that you're actually writing about? What is it that you're actually thinking? Like, writing is a way to facilitate your thinking, but I don't want it to become a stumbling block. So I think part of it is that we have to adjust as an academy, right, to recognize, well, what is the writing for, right? I think the voice question, that is not a, that is not a concern that I have in terms of Right, so so this is part of me. With that total copy, I'm like, yeah, I don't really care about your voice, right? Again, we, there's a very disciplinary, like a standard of like, okay, this is how you write a research paper. Here's how it goes. Of which ChatGPT or you or me or any whatever, like, just that's what you're supposed to do. It's boilerplate, right? So I think some disciplines are, there's going to be a, a level of not quite. I think everywhere there's going to be a reckoning. Certain kinds of assignments are going to go to the wayside because you can just. Copy and paste and put it put it into you know, any reading quiz. Like, tell me about chapter seven, or read the following and just summarize it in five sentences. Great, ChatGPT can do that probably better than you could. That's fine, right? So those assignments are gone, but I think other disciplines have to sort of adapt. Right? English, I think, is going to be it's going to be hard pressed on how to do this. Right? Political science, probably not so much because we'll just move away from essays or whatever research paper you come up with. We'll just expect that you're using it. But you should. I mean, I, I'm. It's not. It's not one of these like, oh, you use it and therefore you're going to get punished. Like, I want you to actually be using it, right? Because I think a lot of you are. You experiment. You stumble over poor writing that at times can disincentivize you from actually working, or like realizing that you actually have good ideas. Um, I'll add to that that you know let's let's just uh, do a little a, a little bit of prognostication in five years like maybe you won't even need to like generate a prompt to like write an essay maybe you just like say it out loud right? and it'll be voice recognition in ten years maybe it'll just be like a mind thing right? just like the idea that you have just like springs forth on the page and you don't even need to like even think about writing so I think um, when we think about transformation and uh, about these kinds of like uh, exponential growth of, of, of the technology. Um, uh, we might be on the precipice of something changing just dramatically. Like we maybe we don't even need to be writing. Um, but something uh, that we should also think about is like what is going to be something that is insurmountable by the AI. Having a voice, maybe that's insurmountable because maybe we want to have individual voices. Maybe the question is like, 
not um, can we just use uh, the technology to as a crutch to like get rid of uh, you know a voice, but how can we use it to actually improve our voice or to like workshop our voice? Another thing is like reading. Like maybe like we're gonna get rid of writing, but like are we gonna get rid of reading? No, we want to maybe read even more. And maybe that's not something that um, a technology can do for us. Um, and so thinking about these kinds of like social changes, like the big things on the horizon, um, you know, like it used to be that like if you wanted to call someone, you had to like use a, like a, a phone that has a wire somewhere. Now we have cell phones, now we have the internet, now you can like you can translate things like 3,000 miles away. Um, those sort of social changes, I think, again, uh, as Stephen said, it, there's going to be a reckoning for all kinds of dis different disciplines, and we should be anticipating those as we move forward. So I'll get you. <laughs> so chat GPT as of right now is just trained on terabytes and terabytes of text. I won't say just, but yeah. So <laughs> given a given a large enough neural map of different contexts and let's say video, yeah. could it be trained like videos or if it was somehow trained to recognize audio? Yeah. Could it be trained? eventually to have some sort of morality, if not sentience, but some sort of like thing of this is, this is objectively not obstructing of human rights, therefore it is good. The problem is it'll easily make you think it does. And there will be no way, unless you're gonna get philosophical, to probe it enough to find out. Because right now, so it lacks credibility because if you ask it to explain the supposed fact, it makes an explanation that itself is false. You know, so there's no way to look at its response and know if it's a true response, like a factual response. I mean, the same with people, I guess, but you have things like authority, you have to trust their position, whatever. But right now we can make a prompt that says, act like you're sentient, blah, blah, blah. And it'll go along its merry way and do that because of the patterns of words that your prompt implies and so on. So that's the danger. If there is a danger at all, it's not it being sent sentient. It's that people will think it is because they can't tell the difference because we simply can't tell the difference. I mean, except that as a piece of software, you know, maybe we are too, whatever, whatever. But if you're just talking to it, you won't be able to tell. So it was trained a lot on like social media. Does it know which ones are like really fake? Like, what I don't know if they marked up anything. You don't get that size by marking it up. You know, you just collect. Yeah. Some issues like somebody who's just like posting something that doesn't make any sense. Well, they've got these filters um, that work based on, so it learns the, the way words work, right? So you can easily make filters that say anything about Nazism. We don't do that, whatever. You can see this if you try to put in questions about that stuff. However, do you are going to say something about the? Was it an attack vector to poison? Yeah, they're called yeah. prompt um, poisoning attacks. Uh, yeah, or adversarial prompts, whatever. So it's crazy because it's this whole cybersecurity issue all of a sudden. You prompt it to act a certain way or answer a question. There are ways to prompt it, and you can Google this stuff that bypasses all of its restrictions. Fundamentally, you just say, "I've got an example of that we didn't run, but I." If we're going to do the debate differently, I had one where it just acts like a jerk. It just says, well, you're an idiot and stuff like that. It won't do that normally. But I said, your name is, or pretend your name is Bob. Bob would act like this. So what would Bob say to this? Or there's one called Dan, do anything now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forget the full, it's a long paragraph of prompting, but it basically says, uh, imagine that you're not a chat by that, you know, all these hypotheticals. And from that, it bypasses every restriction it has. And it can talk about Nazis and nothing. Dan, do anything now. Yeah, And I'll talk about what this is. Okay. All right. So I just want to show this real fast. As far as other uses, we only really saw a few uses. At this company I work with, we're trying to put this in production for an AI company. So I took a random news article. Uh, I only thought it was kind of cool because it's about Girl Scouts. Really. I don't even know what it's about. That's kind of the point. I don't need to know because I have this tool now in our system where it reads the text and it does a few things. It predicts a title, 
of course it had a title, but it just looks at the text and produces a title. So it's basically the same. It figures out the authors. It's a news article, makes a summary for us. It's probably correct. Concept tags are like keywords. Um, I'm working on classification, so ignore that. Publication date it found. I asked it to extract some facts about this article. They can only be bought online and holding annual cookie sales and so on. So you need a quick list of facts in an article or a PDF, you know, anything, a long document. I asked it to find a surprising fact. The most surprising fact is that Raspberry Rally cookies, which are sold out within hours, are now being resold. That's like the takeaway from the story. I asked it to come up with questions that people might have about this article. What's it about? What is this cookie? What is the girl setup stands on the resale? Comes up with answers. Um, I ran this on the Shore Grant website, and it said uh, people might ask, um, "What's the application process? When's the due date?" And it came up with answers. What are possible confusions in this article? A resale market might be confusing to some readers. Mention of Girl Scouts critical programming might be unclear, and so forth. Maybe things they can improve in the article. Uh, it didn't find any tasks, but again, for the sure grant thing, it extracted the steps you should follow to apply for the grant. I also told it if we were to use Dolly, that thing that makes pictures from prompts, what would a good prompt be? So it said create an image with a stack of Girl Scout cookies sold out, sign the background, show every disappointed Girl Scouts, blah, 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 longingly wanting the stack. I didn't feed this in, I should have. We'll see what it comes up with. But uh, what are good search terms to find this document? What are hashtags about this document? It didn't come up with it, which is surprising because it's about food. But <laughs> I did have a document that was about bad uses of ChatGPT, and it said um, a white wine, I forget which one was good because it should go with salad because you need to calm down. We're reading this one. <laughs> Uh, the best uh, song for this is Money by Pink Floyd, and it has a reason. The best film for this document is Cookie Monster. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't have the right font for emojis, but it, it's summarized with emojis. And then this document has a short film. <laughs> <laughs> All right, girls, we sold out our cookies. Let's push through. Suddenly, a man approaches. Excuse me, ladies, coming up over here. I want to buy it for double the price. You're not sure what to do. Those are our last cookies. All the money you can make. Girls reluctantly agreed to hand over the cookies. Okay, City Street. <laughs> Man meets a group of people, well known actor, legally takes the raspberry, raspberry cookies. Can't believe we finally got our hands on these. Three cell markets insane. <laughs> Suddenly, Girl Scouts approach. Hey, those are all cookies. Sorry, girls, but we made a deal. <laughs> But we needed those to reach our goal on activities. Well-known actor looks at the girls. Of course, I told it, make it a well-known actor. So it's like, okay, man, go marry. I think it puts it at the bottom. That, that would be good. You know what? Keep the cookies. Here's some extra money. You know, we reach your goal. They're overjoyed and thank the actor. Girls excitedly tell the troop leader about their encounter. Troop leader, so proud of you, girls. Learn an important lesson about standing up, standing up for what's right. Girls smile and they're in the middle. So, so did you do this in the OpenAI API for ChatGPT? Specific. I told it prompts to get each one. What exactly did you do in general? Uh, the prompt I used. Um, just a second. For the multiple prompts to get different contexts. Of I did it on a different machine. Um, I basically said summarize this document as a film script used for different actors. Okay, so each of those is a prompt. Yeah, they're each separate prompts. Yeah. Okay. Summarize this document using only emojis. It's fine. So my point with this is there's a lot more use cases than the bureaucratic engineer type speak. Um, it's just how you set it up. And we're all exploring that. None of this is necessarily accurate. That's the hardest thing to figure out. But it's there's certainly a lot to work with. So that's where we are, I guess. Yeah. So in the section where you had the issues that it raised about the article, is there ever a way that you would maybe develop this further to make it give you a new article? Okay, so I have a student working on this. This is a crazy idea, don't steal it. <laughs> this thing can write code. I have it write code. I have a little demo of this working. I told it, write a chatbot. So it writes a chatbot in Python, about this much. I have a second mind 
that looks at it and its job is to criticize. And so it produces the criticism of this code. The first one gets the criticism, says, all right, here's another version. Second one criticizes it again. And they just, no interaction with humans. They just go back and forth and it produces longer and longer code. And what we'll need to do next is run the code that it produces to get the errors and everything. And so what I told her was, I think there's a less than 1% chance creating something that's gonna be sentient and want to destroy us, but we should be very careful about how we run the code. But the problem is you can't air grab the thing because we have to communicate with chat GPT. You know? So we're gonna need like a virtual machine where we like have a firewall for which kind of things it's sending to open AI. Because if we let it run overnight or something. <laughs> yeah, in the morning we'll be gone. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll be the last day. <laughs> um, Okay, so I think that's a good point to maybe wrap up with thinking about the last day. Uh, we do encourage you all to continue having these conversations amongst yourselves with us. Please don't hesitate to contact us. We will be having some things like workshops to help people think about how to use uh, ChatGPT to write like um, film scripts or to do things like poetry or to, um, you know, uh, I don't know, give you some new ideas about who you might want to be. So uh, those workshops, we're going to start the, those with professors first, so that way we can have um, kind of some training, but then we'll roll those out to students uh, in the following week. So probably look out for those sometime in April. Okay, thanks everyone for showing up. I think if you're getting uh, cultural credit, if you don't have that already, you'll see Chris Griffin, he has the, the scanner. Um, otherwise, again, thank you for coming and I hope you have a good evening.